Coming up on DTNS, what the NBC YouTube fight and temporary peace means, the reality behind the Let's Encrypt failure, and what the U.S. wants to do to stop SIM swapping. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, October 1st. Welcome to Rocktober 2021. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And from somewhere in St. Louis, I'm Patrick Norton. <laughs> drawing, the, drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Uh, we were just we were just talking sports teams, cho choosing who to cheer for and who to cheer against and why some people think baseball is boring. Get that wider conversation on our expanded show, Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. That is where you can join our top patrons like Dustin Campbell, Tim Deputy, and Brandon Brooks. Let us begin with a few tech things you should know. Nigerian President Muhammadu Buhari ordered the country's ban on Twitter be lifted on the condition it's used for business and positive engagements. Nigeria banned Twitter back on June 5th after the platform deleted one of the president's tweets. Nothing but ads and cat pics. <laughs> Taiwan Economy Minister Wang Meihua said in an interview Thursday that Taiwan needs Malaysia's help to resolve the global shortage of auto semiconductors, particularly in auto chip packaging. Manufacturing happens a lot in Taiwan. Packaging of the chips happens in Malaysia. Wang said that Taiwan is a major chip producer, but companies in Malaysia provide services not offered by Taiwanese firms. Malaysia is home to suppliers and factories serving semiconductor makers such as STM Microelectronics, Infineon, and automakers like Toyota and Ford. The California Department of Motor Vehicles granted Waymo and Cruise permission to operate general public autonomous vehicle rides under certain conditions within the state. Cruise's permit allows five autonomous, no human vehicle deployments for commercial services in part of San Francisco between the hours of 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. at a maximum speed of 30 miles per hour. Uh, with good weather conditions only. So if it's super foggy, can't be driving. Waymo can operate in parts of San Francisco and also San Mateo counties with a speed limit of 65 miles per hour with good weather visibility, but must put human drivers behind the wheel as well. The California Public Utilities Commission needs to sign off on deployment permits for both companies before paid passenger rides can begin. The human drivers in San Mateo are so they can turn around and explain, I can't go faster than 65. I'm sorry. It's against the rules. Uh, <laughs> Google has ended its plans to offer bank accounts from Citigroup and Stanford Federal Credit Union to users of Google Pay. Not going to happen. Google says that instead it will focus on, quote, delivering digital enablement for banks and other financial service providers rather than us serving as the provider of these services. Mm. Foxconn bought an Ohio EV factory from the EV startup Lordstown Motors in a $230 million deal. Lordstown Motors will remain a tenant at the plant and will work with Foxconn to build its upcoming electric pickup truck at the facility. All right, let's talk a little more about the spat fight brawl between NBC and YouTube TV. Uh, it's what I consider a sign that over-the-top multi-channel streaming services have come into maturity it's a good old-fashioned carriage dispute. It goes back into the 80s even and find examples of, of cable companies uh, and, and uh, television networks blasting each other on air about who's at fault for losing channels. Well, NBC started running messages in the versions of its broadcasting cable channels that aired on YouTube TV, warning viewers that greedy Google is going to drop its channels on Thursday and gave them a website where they could go complain to Google and everything. Google made a blog post saying it just wants to pay the same as all the other services that carry NBC channels. It's not asking for anything special. It also promised to lower the monthly fee of YouTube TV by $10 per month if NBC channels became unavailable. Thursday night came and went, and the NBC channel stayed up. A spokesperson for NBC Universal said in a statement that NBC Universal and YouTube TV have agreed to a short extension while parties continue talks. They did not say how long that extension was for. Basically, NBC wants to keep its rates to YouTube TV high and wants Google to bundle in Peacock as an offering for YouTube TV, the way it bundles uh, services like HBO Max, uh, for instance. Although Ars Technica sources say that Peacock idea is now off the table, um, that they're just talking rates. One question for you guys, are these two companies fighting over scraps? I mean, multi-channel services on cable are declining. And while YouTube TV is doing better than some of these, 
these multi-channel over the internet services are not booming. Patrick, what do you think? Um, I don't know. You know, it's been so exhausting over the last couple of years watching, you know, this company won't be, you know, Amazon doesn't do this or this doesn't do that or that doesn't these. And yes, this is an old fashioned carriage spat. And I just feel like YouTube's promising itself or pushing itself that it's the replacement for cable because there's still a staggering number of cable users out there and they need NBC to do that. This just, a, you know, it's, it's yet another you know, money grab. I mean, it's, it's, I just feel like multi, I, I, I'm, I'm so not into any bundle of channels where 90% of the channels I don't watch I'm paying for. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I heard Sarah giggling there. Um, where it's just like, Oh, 437 channels and the average person skims nine and watches more than four hours a week on like two or three. I think that was the numbers they told us years ago. Um, it's just, you know, I, as as long as there's as long as there's carriage and platforms and Fire TV and Apple TV and Roku TV and Google TV and YouTube TV and cable networks and pissy little you know uh, ISPs that want to extort more money out of uh, you know Netflix or any other channel, this is this is just never going away. It's never going away, Tom. Oh no. Well, oh, for, no. from somebody who pays for YouTube TV. Uh, I, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I'm in the minority here, but I was like, I'd like to pay $55 a month instead of 65. Who cares? Make NBC go yeah. away. It's fine. Now, if we were still during the Olympics, this would be much more of a headache, right? Uh, right. so it's interesting timing that this is all happening when it's happening. We also don't know how long the talks are being extended. Uh, you know, I'm, I sort of imagine someone being like, when do I pull the plug? And NBC is like, not yet. Or YouTube TV or who, <laughs> you know, whoever we're still talking, give it a week. Uh, but, uh, but I, I like YouTube TV is the only multi-channel cable alternative I have subscribed sure. to for any length of time. It's just a lot cheaper than anything I could have gotten in the past. Uh, even when you get like Comcast specials and stuff, it's like, it's only right. $65 for the first year and then they jack it way up. I don't pay for any add-ons. Um, I, I, yeah, you know, I, I have a little bit of a la carte stuff going on. I like it a lot, but uh, I, I also completely agree that really I'm mostly paying for ESPN and maybe, you know, an award show here and there. Most of the channels, go unwatched. Um, I am certainly paying for stuff that I don't use, uh, but it's kind of my best option right now for variety. I think you drive yourself crazy if you think about the stuff you're not watching. What I try to do personally is say, what do I need out of the service? And is it worth what they would make me pay for it? And pretend I'm only paying for that. Because a lot of people were complaining, speaking of ESPN, a lot of people were complaining, why can't I just get ESPN? I'm like, look, ESPN is probably going to charge you $20 a month if you just got ESPN, which you can do right now. You can go to Sling TV. Of course, I think it's now $30 or $35 a month. But back when I was making this argument in the early days, it was only $20. You could go to Sling TV, get ESPN, and only pay $20 a month or now $35 a month. If that's worth it to you, just do that. And people are like, yeah, but then I get all those other channels. I'm like, pretend you don't. If all you want is the <laughs> SPN, just, just pay that amount yeah, and get ignore it. Ignore them. Like, people yeah. get caught up in, in like, yeah, but but I don't, I wanna pay for just the SPN, uh, and which, you know, that's, that's a different way of looking at it. But, I do think we're headed towards a world where you will, the ESPN plus will eventually get more and more things and yeah. become paying for ESPN. And I'm curious if these multi-channel systems will stay up then, because I pay for a direct TV stream because we get Sportsnet LA, which my wife uh, uses to watch the Dodgers. And it's the only way to get it outside of spectrum cable uh, that there is. And then I also use it to watch NHL network and MLB network and stuff. But if we could get all of those a la carte, we might not get direct TV stream. It depend would depend sure. on the cost, I guess. I mean, it's crazy. I'm looking at the the list of NBC shows, and I'm I'm laughing because I'm so detached from cable. I'm so detached from networks. But it's like America's Got Talent, six million viewers. American Ninja Warrior, three point three million viewers. This Is Us, five point five seven million viewers. Chicago Fire, Chicago Med, Chicago PD, six to seven million viewers. Law and Order, Law and Order. It's just it's interesting watching this. This whole, it, I, I was, I had a conversation with somebody trying to explain to my, actually with my boys talking about uh, the miracle, the movie about the 1980 hockey team and how everybody I knew, like 
everybody knew where they were when that happened um, because it was such this huge event and it was it was something that everybody watched and it was available anywhere anybody had a television and just how fragmented things are today um, yeah I mean, all those NBC shows you can get on Peacock. A lot of the Fox right. stuff is going to end up showing up on Tubi, it looks like. So the the shows, at least, will still be available, even if the multi-channel services go away. It's, it's I, all going to yeah. change. Yeah, it's. I, I remember it was during Wimbledon, and a friend of mine who pays for ESPN Plus was like, wait a second, you know, because I'm like, oh, you got to, you know, tune into this match. He's like, hold on, like... So ESPN Plus is not going to show me this. Like, what am I paying for? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> you know. It's like there's still so many questions about what exactly do I get with what I'm paying for, yeah, and, yeah. and if I'm saving money, what am I missing? So yeah, there's there's work to be done. There's a long time for the transition to happen for sure. Yeah. Well, the standalone version of Microsoft Office 2021 launches on October 5th, and Microsoft just announced some details. If you don't subscribe to Office or you don't want to subscribe to Office, here's what you need to know. The major consumer version, Office Home and Student for Windows and Mac, will be $150 and includes Word, Excel, PowerPoint, OneNote, and Teams. Microsoft 365 costs $70 per year or $7 per month with the family plan for up to six people running $100 per year and $10 per month. It adds OneDrive, Microsoft Editor, and Microsoft Family Safety, plus access and publisher for PCs. Office Home and Business 2021 costs $250 and adds Outlook and the right to use it in a business setting. In both versions, you get the new refreshed ribbon interface to match Windows 11. And coming over from the Microsoft 365 subscription versions are Excel and PowerPoint improvements with things like better inking and Outlook trans translation. You can all now, now also collaborate on documents in real time. And there is OneDrive support and Teams integration as well. You know, I'm glad you brought up the Microsoft 365 stuff because I, I I see a lot of people in our chat room and Discord saying, I, I don't want to subscribe. I just want to buy the thing. And they get very excited when the standalone version finally comes out. But you don't get as much. And I know there's still good reasons to just get the standalone, but you don't get the collaboration. You don't get OneDrive. Well, now you're getting the collaboration. Okay, but you still don't get OneDrive. Uh, you still don't get the continuing updates. There, Patrick, what, what do you think is the sensible reason to get the standalone version of Office versus the ongoing subscription? <laughs> I was laughing as I was reading this story, uh, story in pre-show because uh, I just canceled my Office, uh, my Office subscription simply because I only had I only needed it for a client I was working with and not working with them, and I don't feel like paying a hundred dollars for an app I never use. Right. I, I don't really understand why anybody still buys most of this stuff. Um, and I'm also I realize that this is office is still the standard in so many organizations and so many organizations most people work with. But yeah, it doesn't. I, yeah, I don't I don't get the alternative. I mean, Microsoft family is like ninety nine dollars a year and it covers everybody in the house. So I don't really know why you would go for some of these versions. It, it makes no sense to me. There there must be something we're missing that it offers. Um, but I got I got nothing. <laughs> yeah. Really yeah. Well, I'm that. sure the legitimate uses are there. Uh, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Let us, let us know what they are. Do you use LibreOffice or just Google Docs? I, uh, I still do so much writing in text editors and I play around with different ones. Uh, but yeah, for most stuff I do collaborative, uh, I do with docs because it seems yeah. to work so much better than every other tool I've used for collaborative, uh, collaborative uh, for projects. Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, another good thing to use is a free security certificate on your website. Let's Encrypt offers free security certificates. They're most famous for enabling secure connections for websites, but they're often used in devices and used by enterprises, especially for Internet of Things devices to keep their connections secure, which is important. But if you know anything about security certificates, you know they expire every so often. In fact, I just got a notice that Let's Encrypt was updating my new security certificate for the website. Uh, it's a safety measure. Make sure the service you're using is still active and all that. One of Let's Encrypt's earliest certificates called Identrust DST Root CAX3, you don't need to memorize that, but that's what it's called, expired at 10 a.m. Eastern, Thursday, September 30th. Now, this was not a surprise. Let's Encrypt gave lots of advanced warning. Of course, every certificate also says when it's going to expire, but Let's Encrypt warned people like, hey, if you're using this one, Back in May, they said, you, you need to be aware that it's going away September 30th. And we know a lot of you have this. 
But even with that advanced warning, a lot of folks didn't get the new certificate updated in time. Some of the bigger ones that had issues were Shopify, QuickBooks, Heroku, <laughs> Fortinet, Rocket League. Shopify, for instance, acknowledged the problem and had its logins restored by 3.30 p.m. Eastern. So this hasn't caused widespread ongoing outages. But you may think, well, it's obvious and easy to update a certificate. Why didn't you do it? Well, it's usually not just in one place. Sometimes developers within companies will implement a certificate without documenting it properly when they're developing somebody and nobody knows it's there until it fails. Modern root chaining allows for redundancies to back these things up, but you may have an older system that doesn't benefit from root chaining and you may not realize that. It can also affect consumer devices if the user hasn't kept their operating system or firmware up to date. So if you got a system that's older than Mac OS 2016 or Windows XP Service Pack 3, Android 7.1.1, those all have reported issues, as have older PlayStations, including PlayStation 4s that aren't up to date on the firmware. Companies that want to prevent future problems with other certificates expiring can do a test, set your system clock on the server forward after the certificate expires, and then see if your root chaining works properly uh, or not. There's there's other ways to do this and other workarounds, but if you were seeing reports about this or if you were trying to play Rocket League or, or use QuickBooks and, and, and you were running into this problem, this explains what was going on out there. Did you well, run into anything, either of you? Uh, actually, yes. Um, I, I did get an email from a, a, you know, a, a service provider of sorts um, who said, yeah, there's some security stuff, you know, please stand by. And I just was like, I don't, it's not affecting me. So I didn't really understand uh, what was going on until until I read this story today. I mean, what what's the solution is it's 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 like quad to be on right? top it's of like, your... <laughs> yeah the developer needs to be a better communicator uh the folks who uh use uh encryption certificates need to not pretend that it's not going to be a problem six months after they're told it's going to be a problem uh and and then you know kind of everybody needs to understand that certificates are in multiple places and it's not just a matter of pressing a button and everything is fine i guess that's threefold yeah and I don't think most pretend it's not a problem. I I really do think most just can't find all the instances. Mm, uh, yeah. Maybe they need to prioritize it higher. Uh, I don't I don't know, but yeah, I think it's I'm, I think it's a problem not knowing where all the certificates are. It's one thing when you have one website like us. It's right. a lot more complicated when you have an intricate yeah. system like an enterprise. Or if some you know junior level or middle level or even upper level staffer leaves and for some mm -hmm. reason they're the I mean literally I, I I I there's an organization I worked at big media company somebody left and nobody knew that that was the only person that knew how to actually in this case pay for uh, uh, the domain like they were the only person that had the domain name registrar uh, <laughs> access like it's amazing how much how there's so many things that there's so many failure points if you don't do a good job communicating or making sure everybody knows like what the tools are and what the dates are um but it's also kind of shopify quickbooks rocket league um these are these all are, complex systems right these are big organizations yeah um yeah oops <laughs> yeah the bigger the organization the more likely this is to happen it feels like yeah Hey, folks, this weekend we're releasing DTNS Gaming News Monthly. So if you're into gaming news, uh, check that out. Jen Cutter is going to round up the month's biggest video gaming news in about 15 minutes for you uh, to make it easy for you to be up to date. Whether you're a hardcore gamer or just thinking about getting into video gaming, the monthly summary is going to bring you up to speed. You don't have to do anything. It's just going to show up in your DTNS feed this weekend. Just wanted to make sure you knew. <laughs> Sim swapping is a practice where an attacker uses personal information about somebody, usually something they found on the internet, social security numbers, stuff like that, to contact a cell phone carrier and get the phone number of that person transferred to a new SIM card under the attacker's control. Once the attacker has that phone number, they can use it to access accounts that use that phone number for things like password recovery or SMS second factor. So the U.S. Federal Communications Commission has proposed new rules to prevent SIM swapping and what's called port out fraud. That's basically the same as SIM swapping, but going to a new carrier, not just to a new phone within the same carrier. The rules would require more secure methods for verifying identity. So before a transfer happens, the FCC proposes that a customer should have to do something like one of the following. Uh, use a pre-established password. Uh, some some already do that right now. T-Mobile does that. Get a one-time code sent by text or voice to the existing SIM card to say like, hey, somebody's trying to change this. Is that you? 
uh, maybe a pre-registered uh, backup number of another phone uh, or have a code emailed to a pre-registered email address. Either one of those would help if you lost your phone and somebody was trying to swim SIM swap. The FCC seeks comments on which of these is secure enough and which should be required. So the FCC in this case is doing an actual notice for proposed rulemaking saying, we want to change the rule. What should we change it to? Community, security community? Talk to us. Tell us which of these are the good options. The FCC right. also asks in there if there are more secure methods or whether carriers should comply with existing NIST digital identity guidelines. But instead of just saying we should do that, they're saying, hey, is would that be a problem? Is that a good idea? They also propose requiring carriers to notify a customer when a SIM switch or port out request is made before it is completed. Again, some carriers already do this, but they are thinking maybe we should just make that the standard for everybody. I think what I like the most about uh, this notice for proposed rulemaking is it really was a proposal. It wasn't, we're gonna do this, tell us if it's a bad idea. It was, hey, here are the options. Help us right. figure out what the best way uh, to make a standard is. I, this is just so long overdue. Mm. Uh, you know, it's 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 been interesting to watch. Um, you know, domain name registrars, which seems to be a theme for me today. Cell phone company. I mean, if somebody gets your number or access to your number, that gives them a tremendous amount of control over access to pretty oh, so much, much everything yeah. in their life. Um, and it's kind of shocking how easy this is in some cases. And all too often, uh, 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 you know, even a marginally talented social engineer with some patience can scam their way into your number if they want it. And this is, you know, A, I love it when they actually ask, <laughs> you know, for the best way to do it. I get somebody really interesting to see what the responses from this are and what yeah, the responses yeah. are like from different companies. Um, that's always tremendously revealing about how different companies are thinking about security, but uh, I, I, I welcome anything that, you know, well, I'll knock on wood when I say this, I generally welcome anything that makes us more secure and makes it harder to steal yeah. these crucial points in our ability to be ourselves online. Um, One thing I, I was impressed with in reading through the notice, uh, I was reading and it, it said, maybe SMS uh, should be sent to the phone before the SIM is changed. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> but there's that other way of, of without SIM swapping, of getting a hold of right. a text message that you could use. The next paragraph was, but we know there's another way for text messages to be here, you know, so should there be other ways like email? And I was like, oh, no, they, they really did the research on this one. Good job. It's nice when they do that. <laughs> Sim swapping sucks. Between May of 2018 and September of this year, Netflix's data traffic on South Korean ISP SK Broadband rose 24 times to 1.2 trillion bits per second, a testament to the popularity of Squid Game and DP on Netflix, particularly in South Korea. SK has sued Netflix to pay for the costs of managing extra network traffic caused by all those Netflix users. In a previous lawsuit last June, the Seoul Central District Court ruled that SK delivers a service provided at a cost and it is reasonable for Netflix to be obligated to provide something in return for the service. Netflix argues that SK subscribers already pay the ISP for usage and appealed the ruling, which should be heard in December. SK says Amazon, Apple, and Facebook all pay network usage fees. Google and YouTube don't. Netflix reached a deal with Comcast seven years ago on similar issues to this one. Yeah. Uh the, the significance of this, I think, is is that it's uh, South a South Korean ISP. Uh, South Korea has some of the best, highest, fastest bandwidth in the world. Is like yes. too much, too much even for us. Uh, I don't know how they got their deals with Apple, Facebook, and Amazon, uh, but I guarantee you none of them are doing 1.2 trillion bits per second uh, the way <laughs> Netflix is. And it's a t it's a testament to how successful Netflix has has been in in providing uh, shows to the South Korean market as well. Yeah, it's um, I mean, it's in one hand, it's like, go Netflix. Uh, and then, you know, an ISP is like, we can't handle your popularity. <laughs> you must help. <laughs> and and, help and I know there's there's a, probably a. There's probably a temptation to to want to like bring in net neutrality and start talking about that here, but uh, the deal that Netflix reached with Comcast was more about transit and more about peering than it was about net neutrality, and that's because Netflix said, "Look, we are 
not going to pay you to reach our customers, but we understand that there, you know, there is a bandwidth trading going around, and maybe we're acting more like a CDN uh, than than we are just a website. Uh, and I imagine that's probably what's going on with SK Broadband as well. And Netflix is going to hold that line in court as long as it can and, until it's exhausted all its appeals. My guess is they come to a similar arrangement like they did with Comcast, where there's some sort of peering involved, some sort of payment exchanges. And I'm I'm guessing that's what Amazon, Apple, and Facebook did too. But man, Squid Game, real popular <laughs> all around the world. That's all, I, that's all I've heard about only over yeah. the last week. But it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's all the rage, I guess. I mean, and DP, you mentioned DP. Uh, that's a show about uh, military police that have to hunt down uh, draft, or uh, not draft evaders, but uh, military deserters, people who go AWOL because uh, there's mandatory military service in South Korea. Great show, too. Not as well known outside of South Korea. But, uh, you know, if, if you get nothing else from this uh, bandwidth and transit story, get two recommendations for good Netflix shows. <laughs> All right. Uh, tell us about what's going on with the Wayback Machine. It seems to be looking forward. Uh, yeah, the Wayback Machine, which cr was created 25 years ago by the nonprofit, the Internet Archive, shows anybody that's interested in historical data about how a web page looked in the past, even when the page or the entire website has been removed or totally changed. Now the Internet Archive has created what it calls the Way Forward Machine. Mm. The previews, what we might expect in another 25 years, that would be 2046. When Ars Technica took it for a spin with Ars' own URL, it was served the following message, quote, content on the site you're trying to access is protected by the content truth gateway. We cannot guarantee the accuracy of free content. It was followed up with a dummy credit card system payment form. Another message said, the content owner has made this content unavailable in your political block. The copyright on this material has been extended for an additional 200 years. So you're probably getting the idea. The way forward machines goal is to raise awareness about Ongoing threats, for example, there are some from the book publishers toward the Wayback Machine against the way that the Wayback Machine stores copies of copyrighted works and makes them available to the public. The EFF, Mozilla, Fight for the Future, Wikimedia Foundation are among a few of those who support the Internet Archives initiative. Yeah, it's it's a it's a stunt, and it's kind of exaggerated, uh, but but definitely hitting all the issues: uh, over, overreach on copyright protection, paywalls all that together. And uh, I'm a big supporter of Archive, the Internet Archive. Uh, we, we, totally. We've used them to host our things in the past and, uh, and, and we support them. So uh, go check it out. It's good stuff. All right, let's check out the mailbag. This one comes from Bob. Bob says he's from the future and he also works at the Broward County Library in Florida. Bob says, you asked about possible solutions for the new Astro robot for Amazon outside of the house. I have the library on the waiting list to get one. We're gonna test it for assisting customers in a couple of ways. One, to help guide customers to a particular section in the library, where the 3D printers are, for example. Two, for assisting staff with customer service. We could have Astro go check the shelf to see if an item is there so we can confirm for a customer an item is there. Bob says, will this work? Who knows? But this is why we explore new technologies. See, what I love about this is Bob uh, is being an example of what I like, which is skeptical. Well, I'm not sure it's going to work, but not afraid. Like, but let's try it. Uh, let, let's see yeah. what the pitfalls are. Maybe there, maybe there's an, uh, a, a new thing that Astro can make possible. Good stuff. Thank you, Bob. Let us know how it works yeah. out too. Absolutely. And you know, if you have any, uh, on the, on the ground, uh, stories like Bob does, please do share them with us. We love to hear the stuff, questions, comments, all of it goes to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We also have a brand new boss to thank. And that boss's name is Lee Chisholm. Lee just started backing us on Patreon. So thank you, Lee. You've made our weekend already. Lee Chisholm. Ah, that's great. Look at Lee. Yes. Lee was smart. Lee is like, I will get all the applause to myself by becoming a patron on October 1st at the very beginning of the month. <laughs> well done, yep. Lee. Good and work, And thank you, Lee. thank you, Len Peralta, uh, for illustrating today's show. What have you been drawing, Len? Well, everybody loves a good old-fashioned carrier fight, right? Oh, and that's what this is all right? about. Yeah, yeah, it's you know, it's night. it's good. It's yeah, it's fight night. It's it's a peacock versus a TV. Come on. And it's all, like Patrick said, it's all a big money grab anyway. So that's what like this image <laughs> thats what this image is uh, depicting. It's uh, the peacock versus the tube. And uh, who will win? Well, probably the almighty dollar eventually will win. 
Uh, but you can get this Im image if you're one of my Patreon subscribers at patreon.com uh, forward slash Len or at my online store at lenperaltastore.com, which also, by the way, I've started to, uh, to uh, uh, put out my um, uh, uh, holiday custom drawn holiday cards. So if you want to get an early jump on the holidays, you can go ahead and go over to lenperaltastore.com and get those. So thank you so much for looking. Good work as always, Len. Also, great to have Patrick Norton on the show today. Patrick, where can people keep up with all that you do? Oh, my goodness. Uh, AVXL.com is the podcast I host with Robert Heron talking about home theater and audio. We did a bunch of stuff talking about Can Jam this week. And you can tweet at Patrick Norton if you want to talk to me that way. Excellent. Well, we are live on this show Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC, and you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Tom will be working on Know It a Little More on Monday, and Rich and I will talk to you Monday. Until then, have a great weekend. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Associate producer, Anthony Lamos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, WS Goddess One, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Jack Shit, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, and J.D. Galloway. Modern video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A, Acast, Creative Ast Arts, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Trace Gaynor. Patreon support from Stefan Brown. Contributors for this week's show included Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, and Patrick Norton. And our guest this week was Aaron Carlton. Thanks to all the patrons who make this show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>